Welcome to Pass the Mic, Let's Talk, an initiative of the African Centre for Ideas programme through Jade Communications. This edition is part of a series of conversations on Kenya's general election, August 2022. Our focus will be on youth as leaders and voters. I'm John Sibi Okumu, and my guest is Nerima Wako Ojiwa, Executive Director, Siasa Place. Welcome, Nerima. I believe that's the correct pronunciation, if I may. It's absolutely correct. Thank you, John, and it's so good to hear that. <laughs> Nerima, in your own words, what is Siasa Place, of which you are Executive Director? Siasa means politics, and we felt that youth are removed from political engagement, and it leads to everyday living. And we push for youth inclusion in governance and political processes. We educate youth on the constitution. I may be a bit of a naysayer. Whenever I hear speak of people who work for NGOs, which are donor-funded, the instant kickback is that these are people who are darlings of the West, mm -hmm. they're sellouts, and the idea of espousing these causes is just to make a decent living. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that criticism if it were to be leveled at your organization? It doesn't surprise me, I hear that a lot, but we have to think about where that came from. Because we're civil society, people actually call us evil society. It's political propaganda. Because if you think about the engagement that our organizations do, is to educate the public, to hold leaders accountable. The government is not going to fund us. They don't want to be held accountable. So we are obviously funded by foreign governments. But think about the policies that are around NGOs in our country. Funding is difficult, and they try to put caps on funding. So it's not an easy thing to run an NGO. It's thankless work, but we do it because we're very patriotic to this country. And those same leaders who are in power trying to create these barriers, when they are kicked out of power, we're the first people that they call. So our work is needed. So are you trying to suggest that there isn't an in-house domestic desire for change? In other words, there is nobody with the money and the desire for social change who mm -hmm. also happens to be Kenyan who is going to fund the education of the youth and their empowerment. It has to be uh, our colonial masters. It's inside, but it's also very difficult. If you look at our political leaders, a lot of them are intertwined with business. They sleep in the same bed. So how can you criticize the very partner that you sleep in bed with. So it's a difficult thing to do because the people that would have this funding are businessmen and these same businesses and businessmen are involved in our politics. So that's why it's easier to have external support and assistance than it coming from within. Thank you. That was an interesting diversion, mainly to satisfy my curiosity. But our topic is youth, young people. And I'd like to remind you, Neruma, of an article which you wrote, which I read by way of research, in which you quote an African proverb which says, what an old man can see sitting down, the youth cannot see standing up. Which to elaborate is to say that the wisdom that the elderly possess is so powerful that they are able to see far, even if young people put in as much effort as possible. So in other words, we defer to our old people. Mm -hmm. We defer to old mzees. That is the respect that we give them. And further, the mzee, if you look at the African demographic where not many people live beyond the age of 50, you're actually an elder in most African societies when you're 45. So why are you clamoring for youth to lead when in our culture, to which we are very attached, <laughs> is saying the exact opposite? 
Hmm. The reason why the globe is changing, our problems are different. And the thing about youth, everyone has been young before. So the assumption is you understand youth because you've been young before, it's transient. But I tend to think differently because if we were to compare a 16 year old today, the kind of access that they have to technology, or even right now, we're going through a pandemic that's lasted two years, but it's completely changed how we travel. We don't even have paper air tickets anymore. You have to use your phone and your same phone has your COVID pass, which you must take this test before you travel 24 hours in advance. These are things that the youth understand because they interact with technology every single day, if not every hour. But that's something that our elders do not understand. They won't understand. And even when we look at the beginning of COVID, our government struggled because, say, the department that's supposed to work with young people shut down because majority of the people who were working within were above the age of 50, in fact, mainly 55 to 60, and they didn't know how to move these transactions online. They didn't know how to get on Zoom. They didn't know how to send emails. We're still filing things with paper. And here we are having a government that's pushing for electronic services, access. We have Huduma. And yet, the majority of people who are supposed to be pushing for these implementations are not youth. So that's why I'm pushing for youth inclusion, because the problems that we are going through right now, it's the youth who will have to come up with those solutions. A lot of conversation, climate change, a lot of conversation, land, food security. Youth don't have access to land. Youth don't have farms. Youth don't have houses. Youth have rented rooms. That's the reality. But an elder, yeah, they are rooted to their village. Yeah, they are rooted to their ancestral land and it's so important. But if you ask a young person today, the first thing that you will do with, say, a paycheck that you get from your first job, it's not going to be investing in land. It's not going to be. And so that's the shift that we need to come to realize. And, and I think it's only the youth who can be able to be at the forefront. I take your point entirely, but my qualification is with regard to leadership. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, as our wonderful title set us up to do, elections coming up in the next year, momentous elections coming up in the next year. And you and I both know as Kenyans that we have a candidate maybe in his mid-70s going for the job for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time and feeling a sense of entitlement that it his, it's his term to lead. And you have a slightly younger man who is being posited as the contender in a two-horse race. Mm -hmm. I'm saying to you, maybe they do not know how to use Zoom, Twitter, and Instagram, and TikTok, but I'm saying the society that is going to vote for them expects them to lead. Mm -hmm. And if Nerima Wako Ojiwa came onto the scene, they will say, Nahaka katoto kanafanya nini? What's this mere child? Mm -hmm. How can she have the temerity to lead? So let's not talk about a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. Nerima, in the next 10 months, mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that the youth should be out of it. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't even consider their moment hasn't come because we don't have the civic education to recognize their worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Culturally. Mm -hmm. To which you would respond? I would respond, again, there's a lot of culture in terms of our politics. The fact that we have to go to a council of elders to be able to select the leadership makes it difficult for me as a young woman to go for presidency. Because at the same time, the council of elders are always old men. There's never a congregation of elderly women who we can call a council of elders. So it plays an important role in our politics. And changing that perception takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort that we cannot change in the next 10 months. That's why we have certain candidates who have been there for a very long time. But I'm not an ageist because even when we look at other developed countries, 
uh, Joe Biden going in, he's 78. He's older than Raila Odinga, but they're age mates. And even when we look at the likes of Nancy Pelosi, she's 81. So it's not that I'm against old people going for certain positions. It's just them understanding the needs of the majority population that we lack. I have a problem with their manifestos not connecting with the majority population. I have a problem when they make promises that they're not sure how they're going to meet those promises. We have a population that now has access to technology and they can investigate and they will ask questions. And because we have social media platforms, they are able to now put their frustrations online. And when someone says something that they don't believe to be true, they negate. And that's something that didn't happen 20 years ago. I hear you, I hear you, but I would say define youth in our context. Mm. I've just tried to allude to the fact that at the age of 45, 50, you're already heading to Mzehud. So what is the young person as you, executive director of Siasa Place, what is your constituency? Mm. The youth in Kenya is counted as 18 to the age of 35. But it's interesting because the parliament of Kenya considers those below the age of 45 to be youth. And I've had rumors that they're pushing it to be 50. So even when we'll we see... Well, soon I'll be youthful too at 70. It's all looking good for me. Imagine. Yes, indeed. So, okay. So there's a bit of confusion about mm -hmm. the whole definition of what it is to be a young person. Huge but I'm confusion. going to say to you, Nerima, that there's no such thing. There is a tribal, mm -hmm. there is a tribal block, there is an ethnic block, but youth as a grouping, young people are not thinking similarly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we live in a very divided mm -hmm. society in terms of economic clout, as you've said. Mm -hmm. So there are constituencies that are not joined at the hip because they don't think the same way. Mm -hmm. so, they don't uh, think the same way. Right. Uh, they never will because right. it's so diverse. Right. We're heterogeneous. But yes. at the same time, I believe it's systemic. The fact that I can't go to a youth office and be directed to a direct youth office. All the counties have different youth offices. State government has about five youth offices. So it's even difficult nationally to see where can a young person go. So those divisions, I believe, it's intentional so that it's difficult for young people to unite because the National Youth Council exists for that very fact. It's the state youth voice of the country, but it doesn't really function. But we're agitating for some kind of change, but look at the uh, cabinet or ministerial dockets. Um, doesn't youth fall under the same aegis as culture, whatever, and youth? <laughs> That's the problem. Why right. don't we so have a youth ministry on its own? Why must it fall under gender, public service? Why does it fall under business, IT? But I'm asking you that question. Mm. Why the fear? Power. Because we, we've, just, we've just said, every time we are told that 70% of the Kenyan population is under... Uh, these are facts that are trundled out to us on a daily basis. And every Kenyan lives on less than one day, it's $1 a day. The next day, it's $2 a day. But there are lots of young people, and they don't think the same. Mm -hmm. And you have just posited yourself. I've introduced you as being somebody who's trying to unite young people. Mm -hmm. Under what unificatory <laughs> alliance? Mm -hmm. That's what's not clear to me when you say you're trying to empower the youth with whatever funding that you might have, mm -hmm. which you and why? Because some are going to be more enlightened than others. True, true, they're going to be. And we've done it through amendments and supporting the National Youth Council Amendment Bill of 2019. So using the court system, the legal avenues that are available to us. But even when you think about how political parties, for instance, and how they are structured, it's very difficult when a party leader owns the party that means you have to have the resources to be able to form a party so when we have young people could you elaborate on owns the party for, mm. for our wider african because you're sort of getting into this whole idea of deep state and state capture and all this owns the party means that the democratic process itself is by its nature undermined 
Yes. And there is no entry point. Yes. So we're saying August 2022. Let's stick to the subject so that we can get an A plus in our <laughs> essay. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Nerima? Are we going to wait for another 25 years before what you yearn for becomes a discernible reality? No, we're going to have to have party primaries that are accountable and fair. So that means youth will have to enter these parties. And when I mean owned, it's individuals who have the resources to come together and register a party. To register a party in Kenya is a lot of work. You have to be able to go to a certain number of counties and a number of individuals have to sign up and register under your party to prove that you are worthy to be named a party. So the fact that the people who are able to do that are people who are not here because they have access to resources to do that. So young people only have this entry point to be able to engage politically. Nerima, the wagons are circling the old thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the Cowboys and Indians movie. I see the wagon circling there. But I'm still asking you, as somebody who is more knowledgeable, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I, I wish to have an explanation as to the agenda that might make the participation of youth inclusive. When so far we've opened up the voter registration mm -hmm. exercise and we read in the papers that nobody's registering. No. Surely, by all accounts, if the youth knew of their inherent power, we should be seeing that the number of people who are coming in to vote by the age of 18 because they're now voting age should be really, really harassing the politicians on the ground because, my goodness, they will see statistics that say this time round, there are another 3 million people who weren't voting before. So uh, the idea of uh, dancing to reggae jigs at the marketplace is not going to work mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe I'm, I'm not being clear enough. No, the first time voter this time around is someone born in 2000. And they're not getting their voters cards. This is true. Because a lot of them are not sure if they're going to vote. They are sort of removed. But at the same time, the Kenyan culture is to do things last minute. I'm not going to be surprised if closer to August, we get a shoot of people who are going to register. But also, there are issues with voter registration. There are people who are finding it difficult just to get their identity cards. You do need an identity card to get a voter's card. And there are a lot of youth who do not have identity cards. And a lot of so youth who are marginalized. The true question is, what are they going to do about it in the next 10 months? There are people who are doing drives, NGOs such as mine, yes. <laughs> are going into these marginalized communities in support of IBC right. because the Independent Elections Boundaries Commission is also underfunded. So they are not going to be able to go door to door and get people to register. But then there are other organizations who are coming together and pulling resources and pushing for young people to be able to register. So it's a combined effort that has to occur. I'm going to ask you about this, the, the thinking, the, 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 the education of the young. Now, uh, the, the kind of bourgeois uh, milieu in which my own children, if they, were, if they were young, is that they would say, you know, they're probably watching Netflix, they're probably, you know, watching TikTok and Instagram. They know how to utilize these things. But perhaps they would be the best suited to form the leadership of which you speak. But they do not identify with Mashinani. They do not identify with the grassroots. So what is the quality of young leader that we're going to have? Uh, you know, how many Nerima Wakojiwas are there? Can we count them? We can count them. And, and they're not that many. They're not. And, and that's the unfortunate thing. And, and that's why, you know, in the beginning of the interview, I said why we're called Siasa, uh, because we have to have real honest conversations of how politics affects our everyday living. And youth, like the children, your children you've described, they believe that they can sort of remove themselves. But as soon as they begin to realize that bad governance and bad leadership is li related to their bad living, then I'm going to be able to see more people being more engaged and wanting to engage. And so that's the breakaway because what we have right now is youth leaders who are not the best of the crop. 
if anything, they are the worst. There are some who were not sure how they got some of the monies that they have using, you know, different avenues that are questionable. Uh, we can't account for their wealth. And they're proud of it. And they're also the ones who are able to get on the ballot boxes and in these parties. And they're the ones that are remaining to be the choices that we have to select from. So it's a growing concern. Um, but then I also have hope because I think that they're good leaders who want to be part of the process. But it's a long way to go. So I followed go. your train of thought. So we've got uh, you wonderful drives. We've got people registered. They fought to get their ID card. They fought to get their registration process going. And now we're in a situation of ideology and policy making. So every single election cycle, the youth have promised something. At this point in time, people are promising them uh, minimum salaries, a sort of welfare state. Everybody will be getting 5,000, 6,000. A reality or political pie in the sky? A political pie in the sky. Um, even this current administration, they promised how many stadiums? <laughs> Um, and computers not for complete. all, computers for all, education, everybody is meant to be on a tablet in a village. Electricity, uh, connectivity, right. housing. Right, so we're saying the same thing in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we're saying August 2022, uh, I'm still being uh, the devil's advocate, uh, the certified cynic, and saying you're wasting your time. Me? Wasting mm -hmm. my time? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, because see... John, you're only looking at the presidential candidates. I'm looking at members of county assembly. I'm looking at individuals who are in charge of their wards. And the wards is the lowest level. And a lot of times, that's the person that the youth interact with on a daily basis. They're able to see them because they're supposed to be living in their communities. That turnover is high. When you look at members of county assembly positions, a lot of them do not return for a term when they've performed terribly. So that means people are watching. That means people participate. So I'm hopeful. But presidency is a whole other conversation. And when we look at 2022, when we look at positions such as governor, half of the country, half of the country is going to be having new governors. So it's going to be a totally new shift. How, how can you state that with such certainty as if you're some kind of prophet and seer <laughs> you know, how, you know uh, because I, I say that cynically because people the idea of sustaining power mm -hmm. in all the political constructs is that if you have the means you can muzzle the opposition in other words you can jig the vote and the counting process so that you go back but that's see, why we have African leaders who've been at the helm they, for 35 years. Yeah, they yes. push their term limits. But yes. this is where the Constitution has saved us. Because for governor, you can only stay for two terms. You can't stay longer than that. So that's why Kenya is one of the only countries that I've seen where a governor is debating whether to go for a member of parliament just because they know they are blocked from the office of governor. So that's why I'm so sure. Because it's mm. about 22 of them who yeah, are but, serving their second term. But then you, you, you're introducing this whole notion of lucre. Uh, it's mm -hmm. lucrative to be a politician in whatever capacity. If you're an MCA, <laughs> you'll get to build a mansion. If you're a senator, you'll get to build a mansion. If you're a governor, you'll get to build a mansion. And you wish for the entire young people, the millions of them, mm -hmm. to aspire to this instant riches view of the world which seems to suggest that the whole idea of community spirit because you know the nyumba kumi i am your sister you are my brother is the idea of me looking out for you mm -hmm. and you're saying that you're, we're encouraging the young people to be photocopies retreads of their mums and dads i'm not saying that i'm, I'm suggesting that that's where it's <laughs> leading that's where it's leading yeah, and, unfortunately and, and, your, and your job is to sort of suggest uh, mm -hmm. with, with respect that because I'm trying to the, the, the whole idea of changing mentalities how do I change what is happening in Nerima Wakojiwa's brain the, the for the fact, better for the better mm. the fact that we can talk about cases of sitting politicians because of corruption 
the fact that they are in the courts is progress. Okay, so whether that individual received a sentence and, you know, we're going to argue how the kind of fine that they were told to pay is not enough, they should have been given much more, and it's the small fish, yes, those are whole other issues and debatable. But the fact that we can talk about, you know, a governor right now having a court case or members of parliament having, you know, having court cases and having verdicts, that's something that we have to push for in our country. But I also am very proud of our judiciary. Um, the executive hasn't followed a lot of court orders, but the fact that the courts have been able to push on certain cases and saying they're unconstitutional, uh, the public wasn't involved in processes, accountability is something that we need to continue to push for in our country because it's only the rule of law that will protect us. When young people begin to see the rule of law working, for everybody, then we will begin to see a change. But as long as we have politicians being able to afford the best lawyers and pay judges, then we're going to have the kind of world that you speak of. But I'm hopeful because I've mentioned the kind of work that the judiciary has done. The young are not interested. This key word, voter apathy, those two words. <laughs> What measures do we need to put in place to curb voter apathy amongst the young? I don't think they're not interested. I think they're burnt out. I think they're tired of the lies and just how difficult things are and how bad the economy is. So they choose to be apathetic. It's not them not being interested. They are interested. Studies show that in the East African region, Kenya is one of the most engaged youth compared to even Tanzania or Uganda. So to remove them from that apathy has to take a lot of relearning why their involvement is key. And okay, also, I'm still saying long term, mm -hmm. uh, uh, step out of the ring for, or until August 2022, mm -hmm. then give yourself another five years, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm going to, uh, uh, young, I'm going to remain apathetic. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm trying to suggest what kind of programs are institutions, NGOs such as yours, trying to put in place to chivvy up the awareness of the momentousness of the coming moment? Even pushing for young people to be able to enter these political positions is one. Um, might not have the resources, we're not going for it as a win, but we believe that just being present and visible because even these leaders that we're talking about, because they're getting older and transitioning out, there's going to be a gap. But when I'm talking about 2022, it's the fact that it's the youth who are behind these social media accounts for the political parties. And I've already started programs with political party youth, the youth leagues, because I understand the power that they have, because they control the kind of information that they spew out in these handles. And being able to bring them together to be able to decide what kind of information do we want to share. Because we've not talked about how, as we get closer to an election, it becomes more toxic with the kind of information that we share about tribes. And we can actually control what we decide to share, especially on these platforms. These politicians, again, it's young people who control their handles. They don't control those handles themselves. There's very few who do. And so it's getting to those young people who are in control and them being able to understand the power that they have. This is also an opportunity for the youth league. They're the ones who are doing a lot of the mobilizing for the parties. So if they're able to mobilize enough and position themselves, this is the opportunity to do so. A lot of women leagues, for instance, have come to me because they are pushing for safeguarding policies in their parties. They know that they have to do it now because their parties are so focused on elections, they want to be viewed as one that's a lover of women and a lover of youth, so they can listen. So there's a very small window. So if we organize ourselves enough to push for things that we want now, then we will be able to see change. And I talked about having accountability in party primaries. If they were accountable, fair, and credible, we would see a lot more you young people in those positions rather than nomination tickets going to certain friends of party owners and so that's how we're hoping to change in the next few months
youth, gender, let's keep it to male, female. Mm. Do you think that the preoccupations of the young, the young girls, have different expectations, should have, than young men? Because you're also thinking about the idea of carrying out stereotypes into the next generation, the view of women. Do you think that there is the young people, they're meant to be tribalist these days because their mothers are mixed, whatever, unions? Uh, are, is there a, a greater respect amongst the genders? Hmm, that's a good question. It's tough. And in my engagements, I have a lot less women, young women, just because of the barriers in just for them they have to just jump over to come to a meeting. So when we talk about the youth, a twenty year old in a rural area can be a mother of three. And so by the time you're having political rallies and engagements, you have to have the time to be able to come out to them and remove yourself and engage. So that's why in public rallies you'll see a lot of men um, but also the fact that it's not safe, it's violent. You're worried whether it's going to come out in a fight, if you're going to be safe, and at the same time, what are you going to do with your children? You don't have daycare, you don't have someone to sort of watch over them. So they're not the same. Young women's engagement is completely different from young men, and, and it's a lot harder, and we have to be much more intentional about the engagement. But also what surprises me is, for instance, chamas, you know, the groupings of women where they contribute resources, merry-go-rounds. They're able to fundraise up to, I think statistically, it said 300 billion, 300 billion in chamas alone in our country. But that money, a lot of these women groupings, they don't go toward campaigns or politics, or even supporting women, or even supporting men. Like, they don't. That money goes toward paying school fees, building houses, I mean, so many other things, hospital, funerals. But then, if we could change the way women now decide how to utilize the resources that they have, then we're able to create more opportunities for women. But that has to change. You mentioned that there's the young mother of three. There's also... Uh as paradigm shift where uh, you had the white wedding, uh, Mr. Right meets Miss Right, they get married, they have children and live happily ever after. But the young girls of today, there is a significant number who are single mothers. But it seems to me that the state is not offering any dispensation to help them be single mothers. So not only are they carrying this huge responsibility of being mothers of the nation, nobody is helping them to do it. And I want you to speak somewhat at length, because in all our conversation, we've suggested that government itself is doing nothing. It's as if they're sort of blinkered thing. They have this constituency to look out for. And were it not for you, uh, perhaps less would be done. Is government committed to muzzling, stifling youth, in your opinion? Committed, mm, I think so indirectly, because even when we, and, and, and I understand why, because we've talked about how youth is 70, 75% of the population, and I haven't explained how the National Youth Council works. I've talked about it being the state organ for youth, but the youth who are within the National Youth Council are voted in, and they are voted in from as low as the ward level, and it's male and female. I'm talking about 8,900 youth in the country. And then these 8,900 youth are led by one CEO. One. So if we were to think about it, it's a mini president. And not just any mini president. It's a youthful president. And a youthful president with connections to every single ward in the country. It's a threat. So that's why even in the National Youth Council, we have the interior, Ministry of Interior that sits there. We also have the judiciary that sits there. And there's a lot of intimidation where they have to be viewed 
and closely watched. Because if this mini president just decides that I want to be president of the country, they can. So that's why I think the government is committed. And I understand that. But when you talk about even single mothers and the policies that exist, let's talk about gender-based violence and the fact that it increased after COVID. And it's related because a lot of times these mothers choose to leave relationships because of abuse. And there are also other stories and cases. But Kenya didn't even have a safe house. Kenya didn't have a safe house. So we had the president closing churches. Churches. Because churches are where women find refuge. They'll go and speak to the pastor. They'll go and speak to the women fellowship group. Something. At least they're able to get some help from there. Didn't have that. And then we're talking about even the fact that they are in this home. And that's why there was a lot of conversations about teenage pregnancies. We had such a spike of teenage pregnancies. But we're not going to talk about the predators. Even the hotlines that exist, some of them are dead. So right now as we speak, I believe Makweni County is the only county with a safe house. Only. That is government run. The rest, it's NGOs that have these safe houses where these women are able to go to. So there are a lot of problems. And, and when I see political leaders saying that they are there for women, they depend on the women vote, this is the question that women should be asking. If I feel you know, unsafe, where can I go to and what will you do about it? And safe houses wasn't even considered an essential service until women's groups clamored and pushed for it to be recognized. And even the fact that because curfew and, you know, even transport, pregnant women were not sure how they were going to get to the hospital if they labor. But that's something a man would never think about. If he's unwell, he would just think about, let me go in the morning. But for a woman, if you're in labor, it's then and then. You cannot think about, oh, it's curfew. Oh, we can't. And so this is why it's important to have different perspectives because the challenges are different and, and having policies to protect. But I'll say one thing. There's a policy that protects teenage parents, um, but we don't even understand or know of its existence. There's a go-back-to-school policy in our country, but it's not implemented. People don't know it exists. There's no funding for it. Let's think again August 2022 we have to sort of wind down to a close. Uh, peaceful elections, violent elections. Are our young people, whatever their demographic, wherever they come from, whatever their sort of class affiliations, they seem to be the ones who should be at daggers drawn to buy their machetes in thousands and start killing each other. So they're going to be the troops for whatever violence we fear. Do you think that your young constituents are ready to kill each other? I think in some areas it's it's going to get heated. I believe so. Um, just because the kind of candidates that we have in particular areas, um, they are not pushing the right messages. And due to poverty, uh, youth are used. That's going to be there. I don't think it's going to be a national thing. But I do believe that there are going to be some areas where that's going to happen. It's already started. And, and I was speaking earlier how I know in certain locations two youth who have been stabbed. That's already started. And, and we receive this information. And it's too early for us to be receiving this information. And, and that's why I think so. Could we end with two questions tied in one? One is, are Kenya's youth ready in mind and body and spirit for the August 2022 elections and if they behave quote unquote correctly what message do they stand to give to the continent as a whole if they seize the moment at the historical moment and act correctly what do we need to do to be ready but just wake up and be prepared i think the country is not prepared but the Kenyan youth are ready. If the election was called tomorrow, they would get out and vote. For whom? Sorry. For whom? For whom? They would In decide terms... last minute. 
Okay. They would decide last minute. Oh dear! So you're mm -hmm. suggesting they they don't have an idea who to vote for? Not now, no. So, so they're voting. A, what is their inspiration? The the the, the great uh, cloud. <laughs> a lot of times, it's who they respect. It can be an uncle, a father, celebrity, and I know this because we've done a research on how youth make their decisions. They still fully rely on members around them that they respect. And even those who say they're not going to vote, interestingly, when if they live with their parents, day of voting and their parents walk out to vote, they won't be left in the house. Mom, okay. dad will say, you're coming with us and you're going to vote and they will go. Message to the continent very quickly. That we From cannot you. give up. We cannot give up. And the fact that we are the majority population and will be for a long time, then we have to continue to engage and find the best ways to engage. The debt is too high and we cannot leave it to anybody else to fix that. It has to be us. Thank you very much. We have to end there because of constraints of time. Thank you, Nerima Wako Ojiwa for those very challenging and informative <laughs> responses. And impassioned is another adjective I might use. And uh, thank you for watching or listening to yet another edition of Pass the Mic, Let's Talk, an initiative of the Africa Center for Ideas program through Jade Communications. Till the next time.